Over the years of my work as a preacher of the gospel, and I know what I'm about to say is also true coming from other gospel preachers, I've seen it somewhat often to where those who at a young age have obeyed the gospel, then in a few years, or maybe longer, they wonder if they were knowledgeable enough to have obeyed it. Sometimes I've seen it with older people, even in their teen years and their 20s and 30s. I think this comes from a lack of a proper approach to understanding the necessities, the fundamental elements one absolutely must know in order to become a Christian. And after having become a Christian, the growth and the development that takes place in one who's truly dedicated to the Lord and is turned from the ways of this world. And sometimes people grow in their knowledge and understanding of what it is to be a Christian. And because they know more now, they look back at what they knew when they obeyed the gospel and they wonder, did I know enough? But I don't think there's a thing in the world wrong with examining oneself. In fact, the Bible enjoins that upon us to be sure we have done what we should have done with the right attitude. But at the same time, we do not want to confuse growth and knowledge and wisdom having become a Christian with lack of understanding that was necessary in order to become a Christian. Because no matter who we are, how much we know when we obey the gospel, one will, if they remain faithful, grow in their knowledge and of, of the Bible and what it is to be a Christian. I hope also in this sermon, not only to help folks along that line, but to also emphasize that having become a Christian, one is resolved at the very act of repentance in the plan of salvation to turn away completely from a life of purposed sin to a life of faithful service to God. And then there are those who really wonder, has God actually forgiven me of my sins? I have come across those who think they have committed such sins that they don't know whether God has really forgiven them. Well, maybe this sermon will help all of those that I have just spoken about. And so I simply begin by saying, will God forgive me? I think it's a good question to ask if thought about in the right way. We recognize that all around us, people are caught up in every kind of transgression of God's will. And many of them aren't concerned at all as to whether they're living like God would have them live and teaches in the Bible, especially the New Testament. They just do as they please, whatever they can get by with. And many of them will go so far as doing whatever they please or leaving it undone, even to the point of breaking the laws of the land. And they'll do that if they think they won't get caught. So there's a whole lot of worldliness in the world. And there are few who are really Christians as the New Testament defines a Christian and uses that term. I've seen those people, many times this is the case when it comes to teenagers, maybe even a little younger, because they have been brought up in Bible classes exposed to the truth, and they've heard of heaven and hell, and they experience invitation songs at the end of a sermon inviting people to be saved. And while they have an imperfect understanding of things, they've come to realize uh, that at the end of life, a person is lost, and the very idea of lost, where they understand what it is to be lost in a devil's hell, is itself a frightening thing. And they will simply say, I I'm afraid, I'm very scared, I don't want to go to hell. Well, I wish we could get more people to be afraid of going to hell, fully knowing that once they enter there, they're there forever, there is no leaving it. I'll take it and see how well I can stand it. And if I can't stand it, I'll leave and go somewhere else. You know, once you get there, you're there as the ages roll. Hell in the Bible 
is a very, very, very scary place. It ought to be. And so the atheist, the agnostic, and the infidel of every description, and the heathen religions deny the biblical doctrine of eternal punishment and the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, to where all those go who have died in sin, that is, guilty of their sins. And many who claim to be friends of God and the Bible and Christ will deny that there is an eternal, without end, place of terrible punishment for those who die out of fellowship with God. And any reasonable person would be afraid of going to such a place as that, especially once you enter, you're there. God, though, wants to forgive us. His desire is to forgive us. He has proven over and over again and revealed it in the scriptures down through the ages as the Bible was written and the scheme of redemption was being developed that he wants to forgive us our trespasses and our sins. And let us remind ourselves that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. The scripture says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, and that means His promise to come back at the end of the world. He's not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness. Well, then why does He continue to wait? Why does the clock on the wall continue to tick off the seconds? It's simple. He's long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Again, 2 Peter 3, 9. God wants us to be saved, but being that we're free moral agents with a will, we must make that choice to be saved, and we must know that he says salvation com comes on the basis of his terms, his plan of salvation, to which we must comply. If God didn't want us to be saved, He would have ended this old world a long time ago. There's no reason for God to put up with mankind's sins other than the fact that God seeks men who will believe the great gospel of Christ in the Bible, Romans 1.16, it's His power to save us, who will meet their obligations out of faith in Him and His system to be saved from their sins. He is seeking men and women who want to go to heaven and know that the way is according to the will of God. To see further his desire for all men to be saved, we go back to the Old Testament to the great prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was working, doing his work as a prophet in Babylon before Jerusalem fell and at the time of its fall, at the same time Jeremiah was there in the besieged city. His job was to say you're here because you chose to be here and you chose to be here by continuing to sin and not do God's will and you're here for a long time. But he in the process of saying that throughout the book one way or the other to one extent or the other, he says, but if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right. He shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him, because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways, and live, Ezekiel 18, 21 through 23. Obviously, in both the Old and New Testaments, God is saying, I don't want you to be lost. I don't want to see you die in your sins, and as a perfectly just God, have to cause you to go to torment prepared for folks who die unrepentant. I want you to use this life to find me and to know how to be pleasing to me in your faithful service to me. I want you to know that I want you forgiven and I want you in heaven with me. 
God has no pleasure in condemning the wicked. And this is why he's willing to forgive when the wicked do their part. That is, repent and turn to him. If anything would show the love of God, it is, of course, Jesus Christ. God himself, the second person of the Godhead, actually became man and came into this world, was tempted in every point like as we are, the Hebrews writer says, yet without sin. He never violated God's will. So that we, through faith in him, which faith is developed by the gospel, Romans 1.16, and of course Romans 10.17, that we can enjoy the blessings that he can appropriate and is willing to do so to us in the forgiveness of sins. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. And if we love him as we ought to, then we'll obey his commandments, John 14 and 15. Now, God took the initiative to restore mankind to himself. Man left God when he broke his will. Man chose to break God's will, to do as he pleased, to enjoy this present world contrary to the way God said we should live. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every or all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And that's just a good summation of saying, here's how God authored a way for sinful man who deserves damnation, to come back to him through faith and obedience to the gospel. That we can be accepted of him. Notice the location. In Christ. In Christ. Where he has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Sonship, forgiveness of sins, the hope of heaven is in Christ. Nobody outside of Christ has that expectation of heaven. And that's important to understand. In fact, in this one reading, verses 3 through 6 of Ephesians 1, there are really several Topics that could be developed into full sermons as to expressing to man how God's worked out a way for man to be saved when he didn't deserve to be saved. Well, in the process of all of this, to be saved, there is the need of faith as the Bible defines faith. You know, God loves his creation. We know that, as I said earlier, because of what uh, the great Godhead did in Christ being on this earth. The Word became flesh. John wrote, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Listen to John 3. You'll know verse 16, but think of the verses that follow it up through verse 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me pause there and point out that everlasting life doesn't just come when you say in your mind the scriptures teach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It says that salvation is for the one who does believe, but it's saying salvation comes after belief. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. That's why the gospel, the power of God to save men, must be preached to every creature. It's through that avenue that lost men, men lost in sin, separated from God by their sins, can know the way back. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is the fellow who's condemned already. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. Why is that the case? Because their deeds were evil. Now notice that God's desire doesn't automatically translate into unconditional acceptance. Have you noticed in recent years, though it's always been here, it seems to have really multiplied uh, up to this point, no doubt will into the future, that people talk about all the time unconditional love. Make them define what they mean. 
What they're saying is God loves you so much that no matter what kind of ungodly activity you're engaged in, He's going to save you anyway because God loves you. Now, that's never been the case. God wants us saved. But He doesn't save us in evil. He saves us from evil. And there's a difference in those particular uh, prepositions. There are conditions to His offer of salvation. The whole denominational worlds fail to realize that. They will not accept the gospel conditions. They have been persuaded that if you do anything, you're trying to merit salvation. They don't realize that true faith in God will be demonstrated in your acceptance of salvation from God according to the way God says you accept it. And that's through acts of obedience. And acts of obedience have never been acts of meritorious conduct. So there are conditions to offer salvation to us. That is His salvation. The only salvation available. In this case, belief is mentioned. Just as repentance was mentioned earlier. 2 Peter 3, 9. But faith itself is based on something. Most of the world doesn't even understand how biblical faith is formed. Biblical faith is always formed by adequate evidence and credible witnesses. Where are they in the words of the Bible? When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you read the books designed to bring uh, people to believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Well, somebody says, hey, those books are 2,000 years old. Well, whenever did truth change because of a number of years? Some of us are a little older than others chronologically. But I, I'm still me. Now the outward man may be perishing, but I'm still me. And you say, well, yeah, but that's different. No, it's not. Uh, buy your car and keep it several years. And it'll still be a Ford or a Chevrolet. I don't care if it's a year old, a day old, or 50 years old. It's still what it is. So faith itself is based on something. Paul said, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you need to believe in the name of Jesus, the authority of Jesus of Nazareth to save you. You need to accept that authority. That's what he meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. That's why he declares in Matthew's account of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18, all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. He's the one whereby deity works to execute salvation in our lives through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which Word is the seed of the kingdom, which declares unto us the terms of salvation that God through Christ offers us. So God gave us a book that we might learn from it. So if uh, what Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John wrote was true in the first century, it's true today. And uh, who wants to tackle proving those men to be liars that everything they wrote about Christ was a falsehood when it comes to His saving man from sin? We wish people would attempt it. It would give us greater opportunity if they would mount the polemic platform and honestly argue that their case that what is said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is nothing but a lie when it comes to Jesus Christ being the only one who offers salvation to man. Why, well, it would be a way to be able to expose them and to herald out the gospel in such debate. Now, it doesn't mean that we... Need The one that's lost needs to learn the entire Bible by heart before you can think about salvation. I think, as I said earlier, this is one reason some people think if they've been a member of the church for a while or they obeyed the gospel sometime, they think, well, I didn't know enough to become a Christian. You're, you're going to learn more. Well, the danger would be if you've been baptized five years ago and you don't know any more than you did then. That would be the thing that ought to concern folks. There's always then the need to know what one must know to become a Christian and separate that from growth and development after one has become a Christian. The Bible itself, one man wrote, is, is as an ocean in which a child can wade in, but no man can fathom. Meaning that it suits everybody spiritually according to where it finds them in their life. It's a book designed to bring deeper and richer meaning every time you study it. And all of us who studied it for years have realized that maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago in studying it, 
We may have memorized a passage and used it many times even in sermons, and yet all of a sudden something we comes to light in that passage we'd never seen before. Well, what is that spiritual growth and development? You couldn't see it until you did some changing in order to see it. But there is a minimum, if you want to call it that, that's necessary when it comes to faith for one to have in the area of faith in order to become a Christian. Hebrews 11 and 6, the writer said, But without faith it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Folks, if I've come to the understanding of the Scriptures to where I know the evidence says that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, and I fully believe that, I have confidence in it, He is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him, I have the belief sufficient for me to become a Christian. Now what you'll understand about all of that as the years go by and you continue to keep an honest and good heart and study the Scriptures, you may expand on that, but that will never change. You know, you can know something, but then it can grow and it can expand. You can have deeper insights into it. You better hope that happens, and it will, once you obey the gospel and begin to live the Christian life. But then there is also the need of repentance. It doesn't take long as you go through the Scriptures to realize just how far from the mark all of us have come. Romans chapter 3.10, Paul said to the church at Rome, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Somebody may think, well, I only committed a couple of sins, and old so-and-so over here, he's, he's gone into sin about every way you can go into it. It doesn't make any difference whether you committed one sin or a million sins, or how long you lived in it. One little sin separated you from God, you die guilty of it, you're lost. I don't know whether, where we ever got the idea otherwise. Now, there are several ways that a person can react to what I just said as it's written there's none righteous no not one some people might deny it even and pretend that everything is perfectly fine just as it is in their life well, that person will never obey the gospel not in the sense the Bible talks about obeying the gospel as long as they hold that view some people can feel miserable for themselves and even get others to sympathize with their misery but they never have enough faith, enough belief, enough confidence, enough trust in God, Christ, the Bible, and the gospel to change their life to submit to God's will the rest of their lives. You can, you can be like a scared rabbit, fearful of being where you are, but also afraid of moving because it might be in the wrong direction. So you just stay scared out of your wits, troubled and upset. That's because your faith is somewhat weak, to say the best you can of it. Or you can do something about it. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 11. Remember, he wrote that to the church in Corinth. He wrote that to people who had believed the gospel and obeyed it. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, because remember the first letter... There were people there who were in sin. He says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you prove yourselves to be clear in this matter. They had turned from their sins. What caused them to turn from their sins that he addressed in the first letter? Well, they accepted that letter as the will of heaven that truly labeled them for what they were. 
And looking into that letter, they saw their needs. And they were willing to change. Because they were sorry toward God for their sins against Him. And that sorrow was so strong it caused them to turn from that which was sinful. And Paul rejoices over that. Your fear of being wrong ought to fire you up to make the necessary changes in your life. It did with these people if we can believe the Bible. And if we can't believe that, why well, study any of it? In Acts 26.20 it says, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. So it said of Paul's work. So it's obvious then that the belief that's necessary is full acceptance of the truth of the Bible as the word of God which produces the evidence that one needs to say, I know that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. The repentance is necessary when a resolve of mind comes to a person that I no longer want to live in sin. And that I regret and turn from the life of sin I've been living. And I intend fully then to live a godly life by doing God's will for Christians the rest of my life. If you know those two things, there's no use changing those things. Build on them and expand them and keep them alive as a child of God. But then there is the need of confession of one's faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. One change that is necessary is how we treat God. While we were in sin, we conducted ourselves... As if God isn't there or doesn't care, we did as we pleased or tried to. In effect, we ignored God. We were interested in ourselves. And if a thought came to mind that God was there, then we tried to put it out of our mind. Talked to a man many years ago who was raised in accordance with the teaching of New Testament Christianity and who became a Christian but then fell away for a number of years. At the time that I spoke to him, he had returned to his first love in so far as I knew. And in the process of visiting with him, I asked him one time, when you knew all these fundamental matters about becoming a Christian, you became a Christian, and then you ceased to live like the Bible said you should live as a Christian, and you knew you were doing that, how did you deal with it in your mind? Well, he said, I simply kept on doing what was wrong because I enjoyed it. And if thought of God and retribution came to my mind, I put it out of my mind. Well, you know, a person has to do that if they're going to know those things and then continue to go contrary to the truth. Now look at Matthew 10, 31 through 33. Our Lord says, don't fear, therefore... You are of more value than many sparrows because he's been talking about... God knows about the sparrow. Every woman they fall, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Now watch it. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Well, you got to see that this is a confession on the part of a person that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Confession involves several things. First of all, God does not want secret admirers. If you're going to serve Him, you're willing to declare it to anybody all the time, everywhere. You are His. You are a Christian. All you have and are and hope to have is because of God by Christ and His gospel. If you believe God with all your heart, with all that you are, your soul and mind and your strength and your body, then you must be willing to stand up and be counted as a Christian. I'm afraid that confession in the United States, because we've been protected by the Constitution with the freedom of religion, hasn't meant that much as it did in the first century and in some parts of the world. I can take you literally to some parts of the world where I've been that if you stood publicly and declared, I believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, you'd have to duck rocks and run. And it may get that way here. Then will you be a confessing person, one confessing that your belief is in Christ? 
Do you find yourselves even now sort of afraid to mention that around certain people, certain places, certain times, because you know you may bring about a certain amount of criticism? Even if it means giving up what you value, we're to confess Christ. Confession is not just in becoming a Christian after one has believed and repented in confessing with the mouth Jesus Christ of Nazareth to be saved. It's also used in the scriptures to mean the confession of Christ before others by your example in living the Christian life. In Matthew 10, 34 through 37, do not think, Jesus said, that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And we can stop there and see that, well, all right, uh, if, if you love your son or daughter more than me, it's all right. No, the principle is saying if you love anything or anybody in your family, no matter how close they are to you, more than you love God, and that love's always, remember, to lead you to obey Him is proof of your love of God, and then you're not worthy of Jesus Christ. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So he explicitly says as much. Nothing in this world can come between us and our love of God, can be more important to us than our love of God. Even if it means giving up my own life in the flesh to be obedient to Him. Verse 38 of Matthew 10, Do not fear, therefore, you are more of value than many sparrows. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. It also means giving up doing things that everyone else is doing. Peter wrote to Christians, people who heard the gospel, believed it, were living the Christian life. And he instructs those Christians, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, he says plainly, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Of course he's talking about suffering as a Christian because you do God's will. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries almost sounds like party universities. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. In other words, you may have been a part of this one time, but in becoming a Christian, you realize you couldn't live that way anymore. And now you separated yourself from that conduct and the people who do it. And they think that a very strange thing. Well, they do. Listen to what he said to the church at Rome in Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I might say to those who say this is the only thing one needs to do, well, the other passage teaches other things one must believe and do to be saved are just as important as this passage, and this one just as important to them. So why select one to the rejection of the others? Then there's the need to enter a covenant with God. If you wish God to save you from your sins, you must enter into an agreement with God, and that is a covenant. Under the Old Testament, and of course testament is another word for covenant, the Israelites bound themselves to God's authority by the circumcision of its men. Circumcision of itself did nothing to save these people. The act simply served a witness that the people had entered in a covenant relationship with God. Salvation is a gift God offered them from being or for being in His covenant. 
Now, being circumcised didn't earn them salvation. It was given to Abraham, Paul reasons, because of his faith, not in order to faith, but because God said they needed to do it. Not being circumcised meant they would not be saved. Circumcision showed their willingness to submit to the will of God. Just to put it bluntly, why would anybody do that except to show God that they loved Him? Because He said it. In the New Testament, there's a similar right. In Colossians 2, 11 through 13, In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with Him in baptism, in which also you were raised with Him through faith in the operational working of God, who raised Him from the dead, and you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven all your trespasses. So you can see what circumcision in the Old Testament for the Jew under the law represented to us today under the authority of Christ of the New Testament. It has to do with being baptized. Now folks, I wouldn't be immersed in water for the reason I was, for the remission of sins, except that God said do it in order for me to have remission of sins. There's no logical connection between buried in a pool of water and God saying when you've done that, your sins are forgiven. You do it because God said so and you take Him at His word and you love Him and He knows what's best for you and your faith in Him built upon His word says that you will act on such a thing. Consider the example of the Ethiopian nobleman in Acts 8, 36-39. Philip entered the chariot at God's directed direction and he preached to him Jesus beginning in Isaiah 53 where the eunuch was reading when he got there and didn't understand who the prophet was talking about of himself or some other man. Now as he preached to him Jesus, it involved how to be saved. At what point one is saved. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, see, here is water. What does hinder me from being baptized? Then Philip, his preacher of the gospel, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Baptism prior... Uh, without prior faith, is useless. It's getting wet and that's all there is to it. The immersion has no meaning at all. Baptism without a commitment to change is useless. That is, repentance must precede it. It would be like bathing a boy just before sending him out to play in the mud. Baptism without confession of one's faith in Christ as a Son of God is vain and empty and purposeless and useless. If you aren't committed to keep the covenant, the New Testament of Christ in your life, then why bother? Baptism is loaded with symbolic meaning. Romans 6, 3 through 7, Paul wrote to the Romans and they had obeyed the gospel. They had been baptized for the right reason. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together, united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer serve sin or be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been free from sin. Thus you're a new creature when you rise from the watery grave of baptism. Think about what's preceded baptism and what, bab what happened at the time you were baptized. God at that moment forgave you of every past sin because you had completed your obedience to the gospel and being buried with our Lord in baptism. Preceding that, there was confession of one's faith. Before that, there was the repenting of sin. And before that, having heard the word, you believed in Christ based upon the evidence that Christ is the Son of God that it reveals. 
Notice the emphasis on dying to sin to gain a new life. If you're afraid of dying in your sins, then you need to have God remove those sins. And thus, Saul of Tarsus, having seen Christ, that he might give eyewitness testimony of the resurrection of Christ, was sent to hear from a gospel preacher what he must do as a believer who's repented of his sins, what he must do for the forgiveness of sins. And when this gospel preacher whom the Lord picked, Ananias by name, and sent him to Saul of Tarsus, when he gets there and learns the condition of this man, that he's a believer in repentance, he says, And what are you waiting on? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Which it literally is saying that when you're being baptized, you're appealing to the authority of the Lord to be saved. And to not be baptized, as taught here, is not to appeal to the authority of the Lord, who is one's only Savior. That's what's meant in Acts 2.38. And that is that believers are repenting, be baptized for unto, in order to, the end of remission of sins. Entering into a covenant with God makes you a faithful servant of the Most High. A servant then must be obedient to his master. Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You have a lifetime of learning how to serve God and improving your service. But you can't grow as a Christian till you become a Christian. You can't grow as a child of God till you become a child of God. And if you understand only what I've said this morning about the plan of salvation, in all honesty, you know enough to become a Christian. And because you know more later through your diligent and faithful study doesn't change a thing that you knew and was necessary to know to become a Christian. It doesn't happen without effort. James 2, 14 through 17, James wrote to Christians, What does it profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith but not, does not have works. Now mind you, this is written to people after they obeyed the gospel. To be faithful. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body. Uh, what does it profit? Meaning, what does it profit the fellow who needs those things? Thus also faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So you see, there's a need to be faithful and grow in the knowledge of the truth regarding Christian living. Being a Christian is simply not a free ride. In Luke 14, 27 through 33, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest... After he has laid the foundation, not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Now notice, so likewise, likewise, Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. And what does that mean? Anything that comes between you and obeying God, you give it up. If that's not your resolve when you become a Christian, you have repented of your sins. And after having become a Christian, if you think you can serve God with reservations, you can't do it. And he says so. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. If you know what I have taught you this day, if you believe it as the Word of God, as it sets forth God's way of salvation for you, you can become a Christian right now. And you can set your life on studying and growing and doing the things God enjoins upon you as a member of the church. The Lord's promised to add you to those who have done the same thing, and you can live faithful to Him, Revelation 2.10, until life is over and heaven's your home. Now the question is, will you leave your fears behind? Will you allow yourself to grow after you become a Christian? Will you prove your trust in God and His Christ and the gospel of Christ to save you? And do you know that that proof must be submission 
to the will of Christ. For He is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. If you're subject to the will of Jesus, know you've heard the truth. And you can obey it while we stand and sing.